Yeah. All right. Um, at the Winbridge Institute, our mental mediumship research involves three major programs. Uh, codenamed information, where we look at the accuracy and specificity of the content of the medium's readings. Uh, application, where we're interested in the social applications of mediumship readings at this point specifically, uh, we're interested in, in the treatment of grief. And then operation, where we look at things like the medium's unique phenomenology experiences uh, or psychology or physiology, which I'll be talking about today. Uh, the team that we work with, the mediums we work with, is a team of Winbridge certified research mediums. Each of them have passed an eight-step uh, screening, testing, and training procedure um, in, during which they successfully provide um, accurate uh, readings about a deceased person under entirely blinded conditions. Um, right now, our team involves 17 female and two male mediums. Their average age is 54 years. Um, they're spread all over the United States. I've never even been in the same room as some of them. Um, and versus the mediums that were historically studied, like starting in the 1880s by people like William James, these mediums do not enter full trance. Um, they remain totally awake, totally aware uh, during the reading. And they, it's, if anything, mild or uh, minor trance. They, they have a little bit of difficulty with the time that has passed during the reading, but that's about it. And then versus the um, uh, mediums who uh, practice readings in spiritualist churches in a group setting, these mediums do primarily uh, one-on-one -on -one readings, primarily over the phone. Um, and similarly, in contrast to those spiritualist mediums studied primarily in um, the UK, these mediums we refer to as secular because they don't subscribe to any particular um, religion or belief system. Um, the trance is also, so trance, full trance was true of mediums historically and also of the spiritist mediums studied primarily in Brazil. So um, these are a, a relatively unique group of mediums that we work with. Um, we recently published this paper um, uh, where we, in the information research program where we looked at the specificity and accuracy of the uh, information the mediums reported during 58 readings. The procedure, um, the protocol, as well as the results are complicated. So we'll just, the take home message here is they were able to accurately um, provide accurate information they were able to effectively provide accurate information under blinded conditions. Um, so we're also interested in the, the medium psychology, their unique psychology. So in, in tests of the big five personality traits in this group, they um, score significantly higher in uh, extroversion, conscientiousness, and openness, and significantly lower in neuroticism than the, than the norms. So they're definitely people you want at your party and they are definitely people you want working as research participants, volunteering their time at your lab, I must say. Um, we also have tested them for transliminality, which is um, uh, the, a largely involuntary susceptibility to and awareness of large volumes of inwardly generated psychological phenomena of an ideational and affective kind. So transliminality uh, reflects things such as fantasy proneness, absorption, creative and schizotypal personality, mystical experiences, and belief in an experience of the paranormal. So it's sort of an umbrella um, uh, psychological factor. There's a transliminality scale that it's 29 true or false items, and you just count up the trues. And normally people um, count about 15 of the 29 items as true. This population of medium says 23, um, which is statistically significantly higher than norm. Um, and so that, let's, let's talk about the physiology of mediums, which is why we are here today. So in 1963, in the International Journal of Parapsychology, this um, French uh, neuroendocrinologist and um, physician, Dominique and I have been practicing me, me pronouncing his French name, so let's see if I can do it. Alain Assaye. All right, I did it, okay. Um, and he made observations of 43 female mediums uh, starting in 1954, and he said five of them who might rightfully be called mediums. 
And then he developed a 207 item questionnaire to, to um, give to those five individuals as well as 10 other mediums that he had come across. And uh, in the paper, it's unclear the level of trance that these mediums entered. So he, um, from his just talking to them, he didn't, he didn't collect any data, he just um, questioned them and, and gave them this survey. Um, he found that a lot of them reported water retention and nervous diuresis, basically nervous bladder, um, exophthalmos, which is the technical term for bulgy out eyeball. 92% um, had a tendency toward ecchymoses, which is bruising. 79% complained of twisting their ankles at every turn. 67% reported hypertrichosis, which is abnormal hair growth. 47% had a particular sensitivity of the epigastric region, and 33 reported a tendency towards rheumatism. Um, and then in 2005, um, the Parapsychological Foundation uh, put on a conference called the Study of Mediumship Interdisciplinary Perspectives, and there, Ruth Reinsel um, reported her findings of examining numerous historical, so late, this era from the, starting in the 1880s, the late 19th and early 20th centuries, um, she looked at all of these different descriptions um, that researchers had written up about mediums, bodily states during and after. D these mediums, again, were deep trance mediums, specifically when manifested in a context of physiological disturbance. And she found that the medium state often involved an altered physiological balance of the sympathetic and parasympathetic branches of the autonomic nervous system, a bizarre mixture of cholinergic passivity and adrenergic activity. Um, and then in our own lab, we looked at the um, electrocortical uh, physiology of the mediums. We asked, in the, this study had two parts, and in this particular part, we asked the mediums to intentionally engage in these four different mental states. And then we looked at their EEG during each. Um, so recollection, think about someone that you know, remember them. Perception, listen while I read out loud this information about a person fabrication, make up someone and think about that person, and then communication, communicate with a deceased person that you know and have invited to the lab. And we found that the experience of communicating with the deceased may be a distinct mental state that is not consistent with brain activity during ordinary thinking or imagination. And then anecdotally, like just getting to know, you know, these mediums that I've been working with for several years now, they, they seem to have a lot of diseases, especially the female mediums. I mean, the majority of our mediums are female. But, um, for example, uh, 10 of 16, so I surveyed them uh, formally. I was noticing this and then I had them fill out a questionnaire. So um, 16 responded and 10 of the 16 have autoimmune disorders. Three of those 10 have more than one autoimmune disorder. And so that's 63%. The national prevalence of autoimmune disorders in the US is 5 to 8%. So the chances that if I just randomly picked 16 people, that 10 of them would have autoimmune disease, you know, not to mention more than one, is uh, infinitesimal. Um, they also report about three times the um, prevalence of migraines, which is significant proportion and more than twice the incidence of type 2 diabetes, but that's not significant. Um, in the survey, they also reported 57% reported lung issues, including bronchitis, pneumonia, and asthma. 50% reported food intolerance and environmental sensitivities. 50% back pain, 43% sinus issues. And then, um, like the French mediums um, from the 50s, 43% did report gastrointestinal issues, 29% percent arthritic disorders and 21 percent water retention. Um, very few reported ecchymoses bruising, um, only 14 percent versus um, acai's 92 percent, and then no pulgy out eyeball or weird hair growth in my population. Um, Joan Hagman, Julio Perez, and Alexander Moriera Almeida and colleagues also have reported that spiritual practitioners often are at risk for stress-related symptoms, at least in the United States, self styled mediums and channelers may be at greater risk than healers and intuitives. So we wanted to look at this specifically. We're empiricists. Let's, let's look at what's going on. So we designed this study we call the heme -Phys study. Um, it was funded by the Bial Foundation. And we wanted to just get to what is it, is there something about mediumship that causes disease in this population? Specifically, do hematological and or physiological changes occur during readings by Winbridge mediums? 
Uh, we, repeated, we used a repeated measures design in which five of these medium, Winbridge mediums participated in two randomized conditions, a mediumship reading and then a control condition in which no psychic abilities were used. Um, pre and post each of the two conditions, before and after, we looked at blood pressure, heart rate, temperature, and um, we took their blood. And then during, continuous during each condition, we looked at pulse ox, heart rate, and heart rate variability. Our secondary question was, do changes in heart rate variability correlate to variations in the accuracy of the medium statements during different segments of the readings? So during each reading, the medium was asked six questions about the deceased person they were asked to interact with. Um, describe the physical appearance of the deceased, uh, the personality, what hobbies or interests did they have, how did they die, do they have any messages for the sitter, and is there anything else you can tell me? Um, and then the sitter gave each of those six segments in the reading a score. And due to the paucity of research in this area, to the best of my knowledge, there's been no research in this area with this population of modern day American secular mediums. Um, it was difficult to predict which hematological factors and physio physiological measures are the most changed during the mediumistic state. So we just looked at a bunch of things and thought maybe we'll, we'll catch something. We'll, we'll, we'll have an idea of what to follow through on. So we looked at 27 hematological elements, including erythrocyte sedimentation rate, um, sed rate, which is a general, generally reflects the inflammatory state, um, the stress hormone cortisol, the catecholamines, epinephrine, norepinephrine, and dopamine, as well as just you know standard CBC and blood chemistry. And then the, we looked at um, psychophysiological measures, blood pressure, pulse ox, electrocardiograph, which gave us heart rate and heart rate variability, and then body temperature was assessed at the skin as well as through thermographic imaging of the hands and the head. And so what did we find? Um, mediumship under these blinded conditions happened. Um, the scores, which are from zero to six for these six different sections in five mediums readings, was 4.1 out of six, and four uh, is a good section with some incorrect information. Uh, all hematological elements fell well within normal ranges across all four conditions, pre and post reading, pre and post control, all normal. Um, no differences were seen for any hematological elements or for all but one, which I'll talk about in a second, physiological measures across conditions. So we saw no change in anything. Um, and we saw no correlation between HRV and accuracy. Our, our theory was, um, you know, there's been a lot of, um, data published showing that the body might have access to psi information that cognitively we don't have access to. So the mediums don't have any cognitive, um, they don't know when the information they're reporting is gonna be scored as incorrect by the sitter. So we thought, well, does the body know? And um, when looking at HRV, it, there was no change in HRV related to accuracy. The one thing we did see was that the ratio between low frequency and high frequency uh, of measure of uh, heart rate variability was significantly higher for the reading condition versus the control condition. And a higher ratio indicates increased sympathetic flight, flight, fight, freeze, or reduced parasympathetic rest and digest activity. However, we didn't see any changes in the stress hormone cortisol, no changes in norepinephrine, um, which is sympathetic, uh, uh, catecholamine, no change in heart rate, and no change in the other two factors of heart rate variability that we looked into. And uh, in addition, the other two catecholamines that we looked at, epinephrine and dopamine, were too low in, across all samples for the lab to even detect. So it, no detectable hematological or psychophysiological changes seem to have occurred during the mediumship readings. It didn't seem that we could track any, um, any changes in their bodies. And the limitations beyond this being a small study, there's only five participants. And the, you know, the, the issue that happens in every experiment is when does psi happen? So if they experienced, they uh, communicated with the deceased person that morning in the hotel room, which a number of them reported that that had happened, and then we took their blood in the lab, maybe we didn't catch it at whatever had happened. Um, so in addition to those limitations, we did only do one reading, um, and usually um, in their everyday practices, they're doing four or five, six readings a day, and we didn't look at everything. We're limited um, 
by cost, and we basically bled them dry as it was looking at all the different factors that we looked at. So we couldn't look at everything. And, um, but I'm gonna conclude perhaps mediumship isn't causing the disease in this population. Thank you. So what does cause disease? Uh, I'm gonna propose it's childhood trauma and abuse. And um, their trigger warning, I will now talk about child abuse. Um, there are four kinds, physical, emotional, sexual, and uh, physical or emotional neglect. And I'll just uh, jump through this. Th these have been linked to problems in adulthood, uh, including public health issues, mental health issues, and physical diseases and reduction in lifespan, which is what we're interested in. Um, child abuse in general has been linked to pain, neurological, musculoskeletal, cardiovascular, and re respiratory um, issues, and then di the different types of abuse have also been linked to specific types of diseases, um, including diabetes and autoimmune disease um, with neglect. So we use the child abuse and trauma scale, which yields a quantitative index of the frequency and extent of various types of um, uh, exper negative experiences in childhood and adolescence. There's 38 multiple choice items that gauge all these, these types of abuse. And compared to the norms, um, this population of mediums who filled out the survey uh, scored significantly higher on all types of abuse um, that, that were looked at with this scale. Um, childhood trauma has also been linked to psychic activity, psychic ability. Um, Asai in 1963 chose to include in his report, all subjects except one had difficult adolescence. Sociologist Andrew Greeley noted that people who score high on side tests are more likely to report high levels of family tension. And then Sylvia Hartwright noted that stress in early childhood tends to create greater than average psychic powers in adults. Um, even the practitioner community has um, publicly talked about the troubling link between childhood trauma and psychic ability. And there are a number of proposed mechanisms for how this link um, one is abuse causes dissociation, and that's a psi conducive state. Um, uh, the uh, presence of abuse may result in the development of predictive and protective um, perception. So you have to learn to be aware of, um, of things that just beyond the five senses, where the danger is coming from, if it's coming, that sort of thing. Um, so you learn to be open to these other uh, issues as well as disruption of chakra or other energetic systems through abuse results in psychic ability. So I think we, you've seen, we've established in this population that the relationship between mediumship and disease, the relationship between mediumship and childhood trauma, and the mainstream uh, evidence uh, for trauma and its relationship to disease. So I am proposing, not concluding, but proposing that uh, it's not mediumship that causes disease, it's trauma that causes mediumship and disease. Um, so in the future, we've received a second, uh, this is not our second grant, another grant uh, from the Bial Foundation um, titled The Development and Implementation of a Comprehensive Survey of Secular American Mediums. Our, our aim of that study is to identify potentially unique demographic, cognitive, psychological, physiological, familial, cultural, and phenomenological characteristics of self-identifying mediums in the US. So we'd like to see, is this, are these trends present in the population in general, besides just these, this, our team that we work with? Um, we also would not be averse to collecting more HEMFIS data if the resources were to present themselves. Um, so I wanna acknowledge my husband and research partner, Mark Bakutzi, who collected and analyzed all the physiological data um, the physicians, Sean Tassone and Judy Gianni, who uh, helped us with the blood collection and let us use their lab, their um, facilities. The mediums and the sitters who participated, uh, the Bial Foundation for their funding, and you for your polite attention. Thank you.